Hello and welcome to the Aerospace Village Talks. My name is Matthew Gaffney, also known as Gaffers. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a bit about my experiences with vulnerability disclosure in aviation um, and, and, and give you some of my lessons learned um, should you find yourself going down the same path in the future. So I need to be absolutely clear uh, what I'm going to cover in this talk and what I'm not going to cover. So I'm going to strip out any detail of the vulnerability itself, the manufacturer, or even the technical platform that it's on. Um, this is purely talking about the process that I went through in terms of trying to disclose the vulnerability, what worked and what didn't. I talk about the timelines and the steps I did take, as well as the frustrations that I've experienced along the way. Uh, I'm sure that the, uh, uh, the manufacturer has also had frustrations, but they haven't communicated those directly to me, um, so I can't share those. Um, and then also I'll cover like, the differences of opinion that we had, um, any kind of third party assistance, and then the current situation and the future steps, because um, believe it or not, this is still ongoing. Um, it isn't over and um, I'm going to keep going until I have absolutely exhausted every single avenue. Um, although, as you'll see, at the end, I'm, I am literally at the, uh, at the, the last stage. So a bit of a background. Um, I was, I'm a contractor and I was brought in to, um, to, to, to work in a team that was working on the entry to service uh, at the operator level um, for, for new aircraft. And um, it was a really, it was a role I couldn't, you know, I couldn't pass on. Um, I, I had already uh, worked with this uh, company before and really liked them. Um, and uh, to A, go back to them and work again and B, working on cybersecurity and aircraft was just, it was just a dream come true. So, um, you know, I, <clears throat> I jumped at the chance and, 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 and started working with them uh, and, and pretty much threw myself into the role. And, and the role covered um, um, basically, you know, it's a security wrapper around the whole, um, the whole program, really. Um, so I was there designing policies and processes and procedures, um, you know, for the different uh, areas that required it. Um, overseeing the, the, the secure design of, um, uh, of solutions and systems. Uh, and those were both the in-house and the third party designs as well. Um, so general information assurance around um, what was being delivered. Um, and then uh, of course, you know, uh, following the, 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 the good principle of trust, but um, verify, um, you know, we got a third party in to do some pen testing. And um, obviously my, my role was to design that pen test and get it signed off by the boss. And then uh, as I went through, um, you know, I was basically giving, um, you know, guidance and assistance uh, to to the entire team, um, you know, when uh, when they requested it, uh, and sometimes even when they didn't, um, I, I could see there was an issue or see there was a concern, I would step in and and, and give some assistance. So discovery. Um, so I think it's it's important to know I did not actually discover the technical vulnerability. Uh, it was the third party pen test company that did, um, and as I said, they were brought in to um, you know. Uh, check my work uh, because like I said, trust would verify. Um, and, and, and then also to see if there are any other issues that A, I had missed or uh, they were given scope in, in other areas that I hadn't looked at because I knew they were going to be looked at by a pen test company anyway. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we sent them on their way, um, you know, and it wasn't just once we were using a couple of uh, elements in the, in, in, in the program. And then on day two of this particular one, um, it was, um, <laughs> we need to have a call uh, because we found an issue. And when, when you've engaged the pen test and you get a call like that on day two of five day pen test, uh, you know that it's not good. Um, so they shared the details of what they'd already found with us. Um, it didn't sound good. Um, however, um, the, the thing to bear in mind is this was a pen testing company. They, they deal with a technical opinion. And in aviation aerospace, that's not the same as a safety impact. And, um, you know, there's been lots of discussions about, you know, safety versus security and, 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 and what it means. But um, when you're dealing with disclosing vulnerabilities um, in, in aviation, especially, you have to demonstrate how it would have a safety impact. So, but I'll come on to that a bit later on. And the pen test company, they're really good, actually. They're, they're very nice as well. They provided the full details, the, you know, the, the PCAP files, and, um, and including, they include a, uh, you know, a proof of concept script as well. Uh, that they had developed to uh, to, to perform, perform the attacks and um, they provided it to me so I could then, um, you know, verify and, and, and maybe investigate a bit further. So um, the initial disclosure took place in, in April 2019. Um, and this was, um, you know, the, 
with the manufacturer, the, the, the operators have a, a portal, uh, which is used to, for all, uh, you know, um, transfer of information and data going back and forwards. This is in the days before uh, any of the manufacturers, uh, the aircraft manufacturers had a vulnerability disclosure program and policy. And, um, and basically what we did is, um, I, I rather na naively assumed that if I uploaded the technical details of the vulnerability, they would look at it with, from an aviation perspective and go, oh yeah, that's, that's not right. Um, and maybe there's something we can, we can tweak to improve that. I was naive. So the initial response I got was um, that actually what had been found was an intended functionality and not a security issue. And just to, you know, a word of advice to organizations out there, never, ever, ever say that to a security guy working in as a pen tester or as an information assurance. You will just get the hackles up. And, you know, like I said, in this scenario, that's what happened. You know, I was like, okay, fine. You don't think there's a safety issue? My gut feeling says there is, but I didn't know enough at the time to really be able to communicate that. So I started an investigation, um, but from the perspective of safety. So um, in, in early, you know, June 2019, I started an investigation with multiple stakeholders across the business. And, you know, so I, I dragged in engineering, pilots, um, e-operations, um, yeah, airworthiness, everyone I could think of that could give me their point of view on what this meant. And I basically, uh, and together we formed a number of uh, you know, scenarios and assessed what the potential safety impact could be. And we found that there were multiple uh, scenarios which, um, which ab absolutely would have, if they were successful in, 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 uh, in the endeavors, would have probably or could have led to a safety impact. Now, there's no guarantee, guarantee to say we would there. There are other things in place, uh, and I can't talk too much in detail about it because that would kind of give it away. Um, but, you know, there are other controls in place, um, but should any of those fail, then there's a, a possibility of this, this having a potential safety impact. So um, we, we put together the, the investigation, we put together the safety case, and we actually supported it with um, the manufacturer's own operational guidance and procedures um, that stated that this, if this happens by accident, um, it could have a safety issue. Um, so, so we had it in our own words, really, that you know, if, if this if this was an accident and, and something made an error, um, then it, it could have a safety impact. And here, I was showing a vulnerability that could show that actually somebody could attack it and have the same impact or same effect. Um, so I passed all those back, um, you know, um, back to the manufacturer. With, uh, with with demonstrations and the proof of concept. I, I made videos of, of doing it um, and provided everything to them. And for two months, they started, they investigated themselves, um, or at least they said they were. Um, and during that time, we were looking at this from, from our perspective as what it meant for us. So we were starting to do our own mitigations as well. You know, looking at you know technical and procedural uh, mitigations that we could put in place that would, um, not nullified, but they would certainly reduce the uh, likelihood and they would, um, um, you know, potentially also reduce the impact as well. And then in early July, um, we received a response um, that they would indeed, um, they agreed with us there was, a, there was a small issue and they um, agreed that they were going to make a small change in the configuration. And, and this was not ideal because the vulnerability was still present. The vulnerability had not been fixed. The, the configuration changed. All that did was reduce the attack, the, the attack surface down. Um, so it was still possible to, in fact, it's still this today possible to leverage this vulnerability if you know what you're doing. And despite not being happy with that, we, we reluctantly accepted that we weren't going to get any further than this. Um, and the, with these, this change in our own mitigations as well, that we were happy with the risk at that point. Um, however, I wasn't quite happy. Um, so um, the manufacturer developed a new version and they released it in early 2020. And at this point, um, I was um, I was not full time. I was I was just working a couple of days a week for the for the uh, for the operator. Um, you know, we, we had, um, you know, things had changed a little bit and, and, uh, just working two days a week. Um, so I had less time to work on, on, on various things and I had to really focus on, on, on the, the, the meat and potatoes of what I was doing. Um, so in early 2020, uh, a new version was released to operators 
And in the release notes, there was a very small little note just about the technical change that had been made. Nothing else. Uh, there was no information uh, concerning the vulnerability. There was no um, uh, information as to why the change was made, just that there was a change. And in addition to that, there was no security notice that had been issued. So um, that meant that manufacturers were not even obliged to um, apply this upgrade. They could, um, you know, still be compliant by running the previous version. Um, so they were not aware of the vulnerability, not aware of the potential impact uh, or the risk. And then, um, and then to make matters worse, they they you know completely oblivious to that and, and unable to um, put their own controls and mitigations in place. Um, and I found that very, um, I, I found that very disingenuous. I found, I, I was very disappointed with that because um, it goes against everything that I come to learn about in aviation in terms of how you deal with issues. You know, um, you can't know all the problems, you can't know all the weaknesses. But if you do find something that's wrong, you know, you have an obligation to speak up, speak out, and inform people um, and make changes where necessary. And I didn't feel that was happening in this in this, uh, in this scenario. Um, and, and also this manufacturer gives um, operators a number of security recommendations. And there were no changes to that either, even though there was an opportunity. There was no changes to these recommendations to include other mitigations that come into could come into place. Um, so there was ample opportunity for the, for the uh, manufacturer to inform operators of the issues, uh, and they chose not to take it. Um, so April to October, um, a bit of a funny time for me because um, Obviously, with the impact of COVID, um, the, the operator I was working for got rid of all contractors. Um, um, you know, like all airlines, they were in a, a dire uh, situation in terms of cash flow uh, and absolutely understand that, uh, that decision uh, and absolutely hold, um, you know, uh, no grudge against them for that. Um, what it did mean is that obviously, I don't lose access to the manufacturer. Um, what I do have though, is a number of contacts in different uh, operators around the world. So um, I've got this spare time on my hands because um, you know I'm, I'm not working anymore. Um, so I decided to start tracking compliance of the new version, you know, seeing if operators were indeed taking it up. Um, so I started contacting those that I could. Um, admittedly, not very many, but um, the ones that I could and got back to me um, said they were not aware of any vulnerability, uh, let alone this one. They were not aware of any vulnerability in the, uh, in the software, and they were actually still using the previous version. So that disappointed me a lot because the emphasis wasn't put on the need to upgrade. The operators were still using a vulnerable version, even though there was one out there which reduced the attack surface uh, and likelihood um, down um, to a level at which the manufacturer was at least happy with. So I then attempted to do some outreach. Um, and this is um, this I found very frustrating uh, because um, you know I'm, I'm not someone with thousands of followers on Twitter. Um, you know, I don't follow that. I don't. That's not my goal on Twitter. Um, you know, although it might have helped me in this case, but hey ho, it is what it is. So I, I tried something on Twitter that didn't go very far, and then I tried direct approaches to other operators, um, ones I didn't already have a relationship with, um, and that was difficult because you know I very rarely, if ever, in fact, I can't remember seeing a single uh, vulnerability disclosure policy uh, for for any of the operators that I could find, or if they were there, I couldn't find them. Um, so um, I tried just doing direct approaches through LinkedIn, through email, and um, as you can imagine, I had very, very limited success, uh, despite my best intentions and best effort. So uh, it gets to October, uh, I've just started a new role, a uh, new contract, uh, not in aviation, sadly, uh, but it was a greenfield, um, you know, uh, site, one man security team for, a, a you know, a, a a medium-sized company, uh, quite a challenge, and obviously I was quite busy. But um, I decided I still couldn't let this go. Um, you know, I'm quite stubborn, um, as multiple people have told me um, through through my life. Um, uh, but I like to think of it as when I get a bit between my teeth, I don't let go. Um, and, and I felt this was important enough to keep going. So I, I re-established contact with the uh, with the manufacturer. Uh, and at this time, uh, at this point, they had a vulnerability disclosure policy and program. So I thought, excellent, I shall use that. And I, I waited and I waited and I waited. And then after about two weeks, I got a generic reply, which was not really a response. Um, and like I said, I was really busy in my new role and it kind of went onto the back burners a little bit. And it wasn't really until March this year that um, I, um, I had a bit of spare time, a bit of, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, 
a, a bit of spare bandwidth, really. Uh, sorry to use these buzzwords, buzzwords that probably, uh, you know, annoy a few people, but, you know, uh, that's me. Um, so I decided to follow up with, a, with another email um, to the same, you know, uh, vulnerability disclosure email. And that time I had no response whatsoever, not even a, an acknowledgement. Um, so after waiting about four weeks, I decided that I was... Um, I was going to take this to the next level. So I, I went in um, uh, and approached a, an entity at the regulator. So I didn't go at the top at top level of the regulator. What I did was this is a branch of the regulator that deals specifically with uh, disclosures of vulnerabilities. So I thought, perfect. These are the guys that are going to help me get this through. They're going to understand where I'm coming from. They're going to understand where the manufacturer is coming from. And we can find a way forward to make operators aware of the problem. So, um, you know, they asked me to provide full details. So I did, I wrote, a, you, know, uh, a, um, you know, I think it was nearly 16 pages of reports. I gave them all the videos and, and, and all of the, the results. And uh, they then did their own investigations. They um, contacted the manufacturer and immediately, literally within a day of, of, of them contacting the manufacturer, they responded to the regulator and shut the conversation down. And I was very surprised at how abrupt that was. I was also very surprised that um, it appeared that this entity at the regulator didn't really seem to have um, any kind of, of say in making sure that, well, if, if they shut the, shut the conversation down and still go direct with them, because that's what they asked, they asked that I didn't go through this entity, they asked that I go directly back to them, despite the fact they had been ignoring me. Um, and the, this entity, the regulator, was unable to help any further with that. Um, you know, they, you know, they seem to have the right intentions, but just not the right um, sway, I guess, is, the, is, is, is the, the, the proper way to put it. So I complied with the request and I sent a new email uh, to the manufacturer and it took them four weeks to reply. And what I asked them was uh, basically, you know, whether the um, operators have been informed of the, of the vulnerability, uh, whether there'd been a security notice, whether, um, you know, operators have been encouraged or forced to um, upgrade to the latest version. I knew they hadn't been because my friends at other operators had told me that, but I wanted to hear it from them too. And, and they also then put in a couple of things that, um, um, which was quite interesting. So I did ask them if they were looking, because I know they're looking to replace um, the software which the, in which the vulnerability was found. And I know that there is a complete rewrite from scratch going on. And I, I asked them what the timeline for that was. Um, but they also included a, a little note there that only our worthiness authorities are empowered to mandate design changes. And I found that an interesting statement. So um, what they're saying is that they can't make them mandate, mandatory, but the air witness authorities are. It, it just seems a little bit weird to me um, that they seem to hold the power in this, this, um, this relationship, but they, you know, they won't move unless the, uh, you know, the air witness authorities are, but they're not informed. Neither are the operators. It just seems a bit weird to me. There's something missing in this whole relationship. And then we get to the final correspondence between uh, them and I. Um, so I, I asked them, you know, nicely to to make the update or consider making the update mandatory, um, given um, you know, given the potential impact and, and the safety implications of it, um, and that they could also maybe amend the, their security recommendations, which I actually find extremely good, uh, to include the mitigations that I'd shared with them previously or that they allow me to inform operators myself, um, you know, either through direct communication um, or a public disclosure. Now, I didn't really want, I don't really want to go down the route of public disclosure. I, I would rather, um, you know, be kept, um, um, you know, more closed loop um, to what, because the vulnerability hasn't been fixed. So um, it would be irresponsible really to, to disclose that whilst it hasn't been fixed. And I, um, you know, at the same time, I hadn't also told them that I, I had already tried direct communications, uh, but I was hoping that maybe if, if they were okay with that, they would give me a list, um, you know, a good list of people to contact on their behalf. Um, and then I got the, the response, as you, as you can see, nearly, uh, nearly two weeks later. Um, and and it, um, the response actually upset me quite a bit. Um, so they, they were saying that as I had not gone through the proper vulnerability disclosure process with them, um, there was no mutual agreement or understanding reached between the two parties. Therefore, they don't support a non-coordinated disclosure. That's rather disingenuous because they know for a fact that when I first uh, approached them, albeit, albeit at the operator level, um, that they didn't have a vulnerability disclosure program. This has been going on so long that it predates their program. Um, 
and also saying that I hadn't shared any content, which was wrong because I give them full details, proof, code, everything. Um, so uh, I found that really, really um, disingenuous and very disheartening to, to read. Um, you know, I, I'm reading between the lines, it's almost like a, um, you know, a, a, a basically a very curt response to say, get out of our way, um, is what I'm, I'm reading really. And this is actually cut and paste, you know, so I, I actually lifted this from their email. Uh, I haven't embellished this at all. I've just obviously omitted the words of the, the manufacturer, the names of the manufacturer. Um, and of course, they don't expect their parties to contact its customers on the manufacturer's behalf. So that's them saying, don't, uh, you know, don't get in touch with them. We don't, uh, we don't support that. So, um, you know, you, you might think that's the end of the road. Um, it isn't. So it's still ongoing. Um, so following advice with, um, with, with some, some other researchers and, and, and people who I, I, you know, I, um, I respect a lot in this business. They have had, um, really good results going direct to regulators. Um, you know, and, and not these entities that are kind of built for this, uh, but actually to the regulators themselves, the people who deal with the, the airworthiness and the safety aspects directly. Um, so that is going to be my next step. I'm going to follow what they did. I'm going to, um, um, I've already started with one, uh, but I'm going to do it to multiple and, and I'm going to make, um, you know, a full case and I'm going to show them everything I've got. Um, and, you know, unless these regulators request it, I will no longer initiate contact with, uh, with the manufacturing question. I think there are enough chances now. There are enough information from me, um, you know, free dinners, so to speak. So, um, I think, um, I think it's, um, you know, unless I'm, I'm asked to or forced to, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to initiate any communication. If they want to get in touch with me, that'd be great. Um, but, you know, bear in mind that, um, if, if they do, unless it's about, you know, some proper meaningful steps forward in this uh, issue, then, um, you know, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to be very receptive. And then, like I said, I know this, uh, this software is actually being replaced. And when it is, uh, and when it's safe, and I know nobody's using the, the, you know, the, the current version, I, I will think about going public with the whole thing. Um, because there won't be any safety impact at that point. Um, uh, but, you know, this could be, this could take several years. Um, so I have no idea where the software is in this development cycle because they won't let me know. Um, um, so I'll probably rely on my friends uh, in, in the operators uh, to, to uh, give me a little nudge when that happens. Um, and like I said, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give the whole thing. It's not a, it's, the thing is, it's not a, you know, uber technical vulnerability. It is something quite basic, very simple. It has to be. I'm not, I'm not a pen tester. I'm not a hacker. Um, you know, I like playing, I do official assurance, I like learning new things. Um, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'm not an Uber hacker like some of these other guys. This is not a complicated hack, but there is a safety impact in my opinion. So um, that is why I've got the bit between my teeth on this one and I'm going to keep doing it. Remember, my wife works um, in the industry, so I have, you know, skin in the game on this. And I'm not going to let go. So what does that mean for you guys? You know, well, you know, I'm sure that there are other researchers out there who are going through similar frustrations. Um, um, or you're having better results. Um, if you are, please get in touch, um, share your stories. I would love to hear them. Um, but you know, I've got some recommendations based on what I, I did. Um, and, um, you know, although, you know, the VDPs are aviation, uh, in aviation businesses are pretty new. Um, I would always, always, always initiate through VDP. They have, they, they have put, they've published it on their websites and they, you know, hold them to it, you know, hold them to their own policies, hold them to their own procedures. Um, but also when you do disclose, remember, you may not have all the details. You know, if you, if you've, you know, managed to get a, um, you know, a silo of information on one part of the, of the, the, the aircraft or the system you're dealing with, there may be interactions with other things that you're not quite aware of. Um, you know, these things are immensely complex. I was lucky I was working at the operator level. So I had access to, you know, not just, um, um, you know, specific uh, software, but also the configuration details and recommendations for everything around it. So I could make that full determination. Um, um, but there are scenarios where you may not have all the details. And I, I'm working on something else right now, and I'm in that, I'm in that situation. So it could be a bit of a two-way street between you and uh, and, and manufacturer. Um, also, before you disclose, research any safety impacts that they could have. Um, so, and include these with your disclosure. Um, and there's two ways you can do this. You know, you can look through regulations and, you know, they are quite long. They are, um, you know, um, they, they, you know, they're good for putting you to sleep at night. Um, you know, apologies to the guys who write them. I know, um, uh, I, I know what policy writing is like, but they are very, very dense. They are very, very information heavy. Um, but in there, once you get into it and you start understanding it, you'll find the, the rules and, and the recommendations, which will help you make your safety case. 
or you could do. Um, also use aerospace SMEs, you know, use your pilots, use your engineers, use your EOP engineers, use your airworthiness guys. Um, if you don't have access to them, then reach out, reach out to people, see if they have uh, friends and contacts who could maybe um, anonymously, because they're going to have to you know, maintain their pet professional relationships, but you know, they could maybe uh, provide that information uh, or their opinion to you on certain things, or even just stay, steer you in the right direction. And because of those, because of that interaction and that, um, that, that research that you do, you can then start recommending mitigations um, that you've developed with these SMEs. Um, include those in your, um, in your disclosure. Um, what I would say is, as, you know, for researchers, an absolute do not. Do not disclose any vulnerability publicly before the safety impacts are sufficiently mitigated by the manufacturer. I'm in a situation whereby the manufacturer isn't taking their responsibility properly, in my opinion anyway, and um, that is holding me back. That is holding me back. Because if they, if they decided to fix this, and they could, without you know, replacing the software completely, they could fix this or put some things in place that would make it much more difficult to, um, you know, to leverage the vulnerability, um, but they decided not to. So, you know, that's, that's on them, you know, but it also means that I can't then disclose publicly because the safety impacts are still there. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit shitty. Um, that's the way, just, just the way it goes. What I'd also say is, as a, as a researcher is, don't take no for an answer, be stubborn, ask questions. You know, you might annoy them. I, I probably have annoyed this manufacturer beyond what they, they're probably used to in terms of scrutiny uh, from, from somebody who's not in their worthiness. Um, but don't take no for an answer. Don't sit down. Um, don't get um, fobbed off. And what I would also say is um, don't be as nice as I have. Um, I've given them uh, lots of chances to do the right thing, and, and they haven't. And, you know, it's taken me this long to basically say, right, that's enough. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the regulator, and I'm going to, um, you know, see what they say. Um, and um, maybe there'll be a, an update to this at some point, but, uh, or maybe there won't be. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what the regulator says when they, they get back to me. And now some recommendations for you aerospace organizations out there. Um, so to quote the great Jeff Troy, a vulnerability disclosure program is not a page on your website. You, you, know, you really need to, um, you know, ideally, you know, have these processes built in place and tested in your company. You know, um, that's, that's what ideally, I'd say that's the minimum you need to do. Ideally, what you need to have is, is, is that that program is your ethos. You know, that is, that is a, um, you know, a feedback loop into your own safety program. You know, so um, absolutely, absolutely take vulnerability disclosure from researchers seriously. You know, do not fob them off. Now, if they turn around and come to you with something that is not an issue, um, help them understand why. Don't just say to go, it's not an issue. Because trust me, someone like me will just get bit between the teeth and they'll go at it like a, you know, uh, like a dog on a boat. So um, follow the spirit of your EP even if you don't closely abide by it, you know, and respond in a timely manner. You'll see some of the delays I had in response there with this manufacturer. That's not really acceptable. When you consider that in, in, um, in businesses, your normal timeline for disclosure is 60 days, and some of the responses I had were about as long as that, um, you know, you have to bear in mind that a researcher might turn around and say, well, actually, I have done what I think is ethically correct. I've waited 60 days. You haven't responded, and I'm going to disclose. And then we're all in a pickle because that information isn't out there before you, before you had a chance to properly respond and work with the researcher. So respond in a timely manner. And like I said before, if there are gaps in the research, work with the researcher to understand it better, because it's going to help you in the long run. Um, I'd also say, do not, do not hide by regulations, even if they're written in a way that allow you to do so, because it's, it's not great behavior. Um, and it's, it's really, it's quite disingenuous to me, to me in fact. Um, so if you are, um, if you are relying on security assumptions in your own risk assessments that you put forward for airworthiness, um, and then don't inform operators of the risk, uh, sorry, if, if that assumption is that you assume that the operator is doing certain things, um, and you don't inform them fully of the risk, then how can you really value that assumption? How can you really have confidence in that assumption? Uh, as being an effective um, uh, control in your, your own risk assessment. So, you know, really, really, um, you know, consider that when, when you're making these assumptions and how you deal with risk in, at the, the operator level. Um, so that's it for me. Um, I'll be doing some Q&A in the Discord channel. Uh, what I will say is do not ask me the details of the vulnerability. Do not ask me, you know, who the manufacturer is, who the operator is. I'm not going to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to talk about the process and advice about how to deal with um, manufacturers, operators, organizations, regulators, 
Um, I'll be in there. And if I don't know the answer to the question, I know a lot of people who do. Um, so I look forward to seeing you in the channel.